Hello, and thank you for your participation today as we join our partners at the U.S. India Business Council, or USIBC, to share current information about the humanitarian crisis in India caused by COVID. I'm Mark DeCourcy, the Senior Vice President of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation, and I lead the Chamber's Corporate Citizenship Center. For over 20 years, the Chamber Foundation has been helping businesses address some of society's most biggest challenges, including those related to today's call, public health and disaster response. During the time of crisis, the Chamber Foundation hosts these coordination calls for the private sector with our government and nonprofit partners. So most importantly, companies can help impacted communities, but also better protect their employees and their families and plan for businesses ahead. On the Chamber Foundation's website, we have created a resource page linking to a number of helpful sites. You will also find a listing of current needs in India that are sourced from many different places, including the US government, the government of India, and healthcare providers. In addition, we have links to nonprofits that are accepting financial donations. They need this to provide much re needed relief in India. That list will grow. Just within the last hour, Airlink, International Medical Corps, MAP International, and Project HOPE have all alerted me to their efforts. In addition to the other US nonprofits listed, AmeriCare is in direct relief. Also added is a new function, which is a bulk in-kind product donation portal. And we'll share inputs with the US State Department and the Government of India for their action. This portal is for companies only, and this is important. It is not designed or intended to disintermediate existing corporate and nonprofit donor relationships. We'll add enhancements and upgrades in the coming hours. All of this information can be found at uschamberfoundation.org backslash India resources. Following today's presentation from our speakers, we'll open up for questions. You can submit your questions throughout the call by entering them into the chat box in the Zoom room. As questions come in, we'll synthesize and consolidate them and share with the presenters. We know that this is an evolving situation and today's call will likely be the first of several as this issue continues to unfold in the coming weeks in India. Go on to the program. We have a great lineup of speakers, including senior officials from the White House, State Department and USAID, as well as the University of Washington to share COVID infection projections and AmeriCares to give us examples of how nonprofits are delivering aid and what resources they need to continue doing so. Now I'd like to turn the call over to my colleague at the US India Business Council, Nisha Biswal. Nisha is the president of USIBC and concurrently serves as the SVP for South Asia at the US Chamber. She also spent four years as Assistant Secretary of State for South and Central Asian Affairs at the State Department and earlier three years as Assistant Administrator for Asia at USAID during the Obama administration. Nisha, over to you. Mark, thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who has joined in um, to uh, participate in today's program from the US government and from our partner organizations, as well as all of you who are joining us uh, in the audience. Let me just note that the surge of the COVID pandemic across India right now has grabbed the hearts and minds of all of us here at the US India Business Council, at the US Chamber of Commerce, across the United States and around the world. And it has created an unprecedented outpouring of support. So we're here today uh, as a business community to talk about what is being done and how the United States private sector and the United States government are partnering to provide much needed resources. We had an extraordinary meeting yesterday uh, with Secretary Tony Blinken and um, colleagues in the US administration and a extraordinary collection of executives and CEOs across the United States. There is an effort that brings together uh, the US Chamber of Commerce, the Business Roundtable, um, corridor organizations working in the U.S.-India corridor, like the U.S.-India Business Council, and our colleagues at the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum. This effort is to marshal the resources and create a streamlined effort to provide support to the government and people of India during this pandemic. Uh, and we are grateful to all of you who have expressed your interest uh, in being part of that effort. Um, I want to turn next to the chairman of our board at the U.S. India Business Council, Mr. Vijay Advani, who will uh, speak to the effort underway. Um, but before I do that, let me just say the 
assistance that has already been announced by so many of our companies um, to meet the urgent, urgent needs is the kind of mobilization and kind of impact that we are looking for. I have, you know, organizations like Gilead, which is moving um, uh, 450,000 vials of remdesivir to India on an urgent basis. Um, we have a, an effort to bring oxygen concentrators that USISPF is, is taking on. And USIBC is partnering with Amazon uh, to create a, a pipeline for moving ventilators into India to support the urgent needs in Indian hospitals. That and many more efforts are being undertaken. And we are eager to work with you in the business community uh, to uh, galvanize that effort. With that, let me turn to Mr. Vijay Advani. Thank you, Nisha. And on behalf of the U.S. India Business Council, uh, I'd like to uh, extend a warm welcome to all the stakeholders, public and private, across the United States and India. This is indeed an extraordinary time in the history of our two nations. Uh, the scenes from India are gut-wrenching and heartbreaking, and the scale is very difficult to comprehend. Uh, our heartfelt condolences go to the Indian citizens. Uh, due to a strong people-to-people -people ties, many of us, uh, me included, have been personally affected by this crisis through our family and friends in India. This is an important inflection point in the course of this global pandemic. What we collectively do right now matters a great deal to the countless people who are currently affected and in dire need of relief. Moving with a sense of urgency is also critical to avert further suffering for many others. This is also a time of unity in action a time for us to come together across the public and private sector to marshal the resources we have and are at our disposal, all in support of an enormously consequential relationship that we are committed to deepening over time. I want to commend the US government for the unprecedented efforts over the past several days from President Biden and Vice President Harris to Secretary of State Tony Blinken, and through the board, broad efforts underway across the various interagencies, the United States is addressing this crisis with strength and partnership. Now, it is my distinct honor to welcome Kurt Campbell, Gail Smith, and Jeremy uh, Conindek to this discussion today. All three are true leaders in their respective fields and whose many decades of service to the United States has made them, uh, made our country stronger and more just. The US Chamber, the US IBC, and the US private sector are committed to helping India get through this crisis fast. It is in, incumbent on all of us to ensure that our governments and the citizens of both countries work hand in hand to help India navigate this strategy, uh, this strategy, but also ensure that its future prosperity, potential and global leadership roles remain as strong as ever. I thank you all for your uh, commitment and collective efforts to ensure a brighter future for both our countries. So now let's get started. Mr. Advani, thank you very much. I'm very grateful uh, for the opportunity to be with you uh, today and with my colleague Gail and others. I do want to just begin by commending uh, the Chamber and particularly Nisha and Mark and your whole team for not only the leadership, but the convening power. Uh, many of us have been in government, have worked on crises over the years. I've never seen anything like this. I've never seen such an outpouring of support, such a focused effort to respond to people in need. And all I can tell you, I find it overwhelming, deeply gratifying, and we hope that we're up to the challenge here in the White House. Let me just say a few things if I can. First of all, we are seized with this challenge and it begins at the top and it works its way through our entire administration. President Biden had a very good call with Prime Minister Modi yesterday, almost an hour. 
He began by saying, uh, India and you were there at our time of greatest need in May. You offered some, uh, support and assistance to us. It is your time now. The United States will be there. Everything that uh, we can do. The president had notes of details in front of him. He went through those, but then he ended by saying, you let me know what you need and we will do it. We will do everything possible to support India during this incredibly difficult time. So our team will lay out the specific steps that we're taking with respect to therapeutics, uh, oxygen, oxygen generators. You already know of the high level engagement that we are undertaking inside the US government, the commitment to follow on in terms of leadership calls. I do wanna underscore for those of us who care about the US India relationship, in the first hundred days, the two leaders spoke four times on very intense subjects and they're building a closer deeper relationship, which we think will have enormous import as we go forward in the Indo-Pacific century. I also want to underscore that we are assembling a seasoned team. This is the kind of challenge that you don't want it to be your first rodeo. You want experience. Gail is leading that effort at the State Department. She's seen many of these things. We understand the importance of coordination, not only inside the U.S. government, listening carefully, listening carefully, to what India says it's need, it needs, helping with the coordination effort, but most importantly, really coordinating with the business community. I've never seen such outpouring as, as I said before. It's going to be extraordinarily important that we work together to coordinate how that is delivered uh, and that we don't have bottlenecks and other things as we go forward in, in India. Every one of the senior players inside the US government, Chairman Milley, Secretary Austin, Secretary Blinken, the President, the National Security Advisor, Gail, uh, uh, Deputy Secretary uh, Sherman, myself, we are in constant contact with our Indian interlocutors, developing a rhythm of discussion, making sure that we know what is necessary as we go forward. I think we all have to realize that this is not a challenge that is going to resolve in the next several days. This is going to take a sustained effort on our part and we're going to have to be flexible and committed to staying with India through this process. It's not only important for the sakes of the souls in India, but India's critical role, both in back office areas here in the United States and as the global provider of vaccine, make it an essential player in everything that we seek to do. So again, I just wanna turn it over to Gail here, but thank everyone at the chamber for the steps they have taken. Our office at the White House is open for business. I'm grateful for anyone who calls. I will try to direct you in the, in the appropriate direction. We are building our coordination cell now that will help us at the State Department and AID, and we will back it up here at the White House. Gail, over to you for specific details. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kurt. And thank you also to the chamber and uh, good morning or afternoon to everyone on the call. Uh, I, like many of you, I suspect, wake up in the morning to the radio. And this morning, one of the first stories I heard was in part about the meeting held yesterday with the Secretary of State and many of your CEOs. But then it was a succession of stories about American businesses standing up to respond in India. And what that said to me, that is the quintessential American story. The US government is responding actively, the business community is responding actively. And <clears throat> it's a story we think is important as an expression of solidarity, also as an expression of tangible support at a time when India so urgently needs it. I've had the honor in my lifetime of serving as the administrator of USAID and before that in the White House, working on many complex operations. And I'm familiar with working with the chamber and with many of you, and I know what an impact you can have. So the first thing I would like to say to all of you is thank you. And we really wanna work with you in partnership. Uh, to that effect, and as Kurt suggested, what we are doing is we will be able to circulate, uh, hopefully later today, uh, an email address through which you can contact us. The cell is a State Department USAID team that will be working here in DC, but also in the field to coordinate with you, to field questions, and to together make sure we can maximize our impact. Uh, we wanna reach scale where we can. We wanna try to collectively do those things that will have the greatest impact 
we want to sequence things. There are some things that are more urgent now, some things more urgent a short time from now. Uh, we will also be setting up a regular call, uh, again, to compare notes, take questions, discuss further offers, uh, and address anything else that may be on your mind or ours. Because we really want to establish a regular rhythm here that enables us, again, to jointly achieve as much impact as we may. Um, I'll just say a couple of other things. I, I think that we all know when the words gut-wrenching and heartbreaking these phrases are absolutely apt. This is a tragedy to watch and I think it compels all of us to action. I think we all need to understand that we are still at the front end of this. This hasn't peaked yet. So this is gonna require determination. Uh, we're gonna need to sustain it and we're gonna need to work really hard for some time, but we're confident we can do it. What I would love to do is to turn now to my colleague, Jeremy at USAID to talk briefly uh, about the assistance that the US is providing. He may also wish to say more about how we can collaborate and coordinate. Uh, but again, we look forward to working closely with you. We'll be in touch uh, <clears throat> with the email point of connectivity and then we will be briefing you on the full team and have a regular rhythm to our engagement. We've got a lot of work to do, but I will tell you, as, as tragic and massive as this crisis is, I've got much greater confidence knowing that we can do this together. So thank you very much. And Jeremy, let me turn over to you. Thanks so much, Gail, and thanks, Kurt. Um, so I'm Jeremy Kinetic. I'm the Executive Director for COVID-19 at the US Agency for International Development, uh, working closely with Gail and with our White House colleagues on coordinating uh, global COVID assistance and uh, in particular, uh, at the moment, focused uh, almost exclusively on, on the, the situation in India. Um, I, I would start just with uh, you know, a, a recognition and affirmation of how important the partnership between the U.S. and India has been on, on this pandemic. Uh, as Kurt said, and as the President relayed uh, to Prime Minister Modi yesterday, India helped the U.S. last year when we were in need uh, we worked to reciprocate over the course of uh, over the course of past year by providing support to India, um, and we are we are going to continue that partnership now. You know the partnership is not an assistance partnership; uh, it is really a um, kind of a mutual partnership towards defeating this global pandemic because so much of the global vaccine effort really does depend on uh, production in India and uh, through the through our, our support to global vaccination production. Uh, we are working to scale that up. So it is very important to us to part to to continue to support India, both with this pandemic, but also with you know, our shared goal of supporting the vaccination of the wider world. Um, at the moment, it, we are we are watching the situation in India with with concern, as as Kurt and Gail have said. I think we're also concerned about some of the the, the, the countries in the region, and so we want to we want to support the uh, the capacity of India to get. Uh, to get this under control while supporting the, the wider region. And some of the ways that we're doing that, as the president outlined uh, in his call yesterday, and as uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan outlined in a call with his counterpart over the weekend, um, USAID, the Department of Defense, and the Centers for Disease Control are all gearing up uh, to support, uh, in, in, in support of the Indian government and some of the specific requests that have been made. Uh, some of the things that we are going to be specifically providing are support to uh, support to oxygen. Uh, we know that numerous hospitals are, are struggling to obtain sufficient oxygen supply. So we are rapidly flying in uh, a number of materials for that, uh, including oxygen concentrators, oxygen generation systems, uh, oxygen, oxygen tanks. Uh, but we're also providing support to the oxygen supply chain in India because I think our, um, our, our view based on our consultations with, with partners there in India is that there is, there is more that could be done to support the oxygen supply chain that is now having to sustain a much higher level of demand from the medical sector than it is accustomed to handling. Um, and we think that's, you know, we're, we're trying to focus both on the interim solution there and the long-term solution. Uh, we're also providing support in, uh, in personal protective equipment to protect health workers, uh, therapeutics to, to support treatment in hospitals, testing, uh, and in ongoing engagement with our counterparts in the Indian government to identify other forms of support that would be useful as they work to, to fight this, uh, this rising tide of cases. Um, 
On the vaccine front, the U.S. is also providing some badly needed raw materials to the Serum Institute of India to allow them to scale up production of the AstraZeneca vaccine in India. Um, and that was something that uh, the National Security Advisor relayed to his counterpart over the weekend. Um, and all of this, of course, builds on our earlier partnership announced through, uh, through the Quad uh, to scale up other forms of vaccine production in India, working with BioE. Um, and, and so you, we, are, we are trying to do all that we can on every front that we can, uh, both supporting the government and working with the Indian private sector to, uh, to help fight this pandemic in India and enable India to also help fight it in the world uh, and continue our partnership there. So we look forward to working with all of you in that endeavor as well and are, are very eager to see uh, and engage with the business community in that effort. Um, to that end, as Gail said, USAID and state are setting up a coordination cell to engage with the business community. Uh, and we'll be working closely with Nisha and her team at the chamber on this to, uh, to help support how the US business community can best engage in supporting uh, in supporting the fight against this pandemic in India. And uh, we will have more details on the structure of that and points of contact within, um, within 24 to 48 hours. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt, Gail, and, and Jeremy. Uh, likewise, the Chamber and the Chamber Foundation look forward to working with you uh, throughout this crisis. Um, Dr. Mokdad is here, uh, he's still getting ready. Uh, so I'm gonna go to Tara at AmeriCares. Uh, Tara for a few minutes and then we'll go over to Dr. Mokdad. Great, thank you so much, Mark. And thank you to the Chamber for including AmeriCares in this important uh, dialogue. And I am grateful to all the participants that are um, sharing their perspectives and their strategies today. As Gail said, we are looking forward to collaborating to maximize impact in the sustained effort and our sustained response. So a few moments, a little bit about AmeriCares, our background in India, and I'll tell you a little bit about our response strategy to this devastating second wave. So AmeriCares is a health-focused relief and development organization that works to save lives and improve health for people affected by poverty and disaster around the world. Each year, we reach about 90 countries, including India, where AmeriCares has been providing access to medicines and medical supplies since 1993 and established a country presence back in 2006. Through strong partnerships with the government and local NGOs, AmeriCares supports hospitals, clinics, schools, and rural health organizations throughout the country. Our mobile medical centers operate six days a week visiting 133 urban settlements throughout Mumbai to ensure that marginalized populations have access to health. Our school health programs provide health interventions and education to over 22,000 low-income school children every year. And AmeriCare's emergency response teams respond to disasters wherever and whenever they occur, providing medicines and medical supplies, mobilizing medical teams, and helping to restore the health system. Over the last year, AmeriCares launched a robust global response to the COVID-19 pandemic, including in India, where our impact reached 14 states. So last year in India, AmeriCares provided and donated thousands of units of critical life-saving health equipment, including uh, oxygen concentrators, ventilators, hospital beds, BPAP machines, really to help support COVID-19 uh, quarantine and isolation centers. We work to ensure uninterrupted supplies of PPE for frontline health workers. We stayed in close touch with over 50,000 students and parents, providing them with trusted information and knowledge about COVID-19 to help promote safety and, and precautions. And those mobile medical units that I mentioned a moment ago continued to ensure that those marginalized populations had access to health throughout the pandemic. So today, amidst the devastating second wave of COVID-19 in India, AmeriCares is working closely with the government and with local partners across 10 heavily impacted states to save lives and help reduce the spread of COVID-19. Our strategy has essentially three main focus areas. The first is to strengthen COVID-19 health facilities. The second is to support health workers. 
And the third is to prepare the community. So a little bit about each of those strategies. So strengthening COVID-19 health facilities, as we've heard spoken by many of the participants today, uh, we have heard these devastating stories about the long, long lines stretching outside health centers around India. And so in response with the support of partners like those participating today on this call, AmeriCares is helping the Indian government stand up additional temporary quarantine facilities for COVID-19 patients, including those patients that are in need of ICU care. AmeriCares is also continuing to provide the life-saving equipment uh, that we've all been reading about the need for, including the O2 concentrators and, and the ventilators and, and the beds and the um, BPAP machines and other supplies to the government health facilities to help them meet the incredible surge of COVID-19 patients. Um, I know that uh, the provision of medical equipment is very of high interest to those participating on today's call. And I can tell you that AmeriCares is well positioned through our robust network of health partners across India to ensure that the right equipment is getting to the right health facilities at the right time uh, amidst this very urgent moment in, moment in time. In terms of supporting frontline health workers, uh, this is a longstanding focus at AmeriCares and has been central to our global COVID response. We are continuing to provide PPE, masks, gowns, gloves, disinfectants to frontline health workers to ensure that they stay safe and can continue to provide care to their patients. And then finally, around um, preparing the community, we are working to build the resilience of the community members that we support on a daily basis and ensure that they are ready to withstand the sustained this is sustained uh, second wave. So with that, we know that many of them lack the resources for proper masks. Um, they sort of make do without masks or they improvise masks out of materials made at home that offer zero protection. So we are working with local partners to provide a million effective reusable masks for our um, for these marginalized populations that we work with regularly so that they can uh, maintain their own safety. And that'll be coupled with health education and um, outreach through our mobile health centers to um, continue to promote self safety, safety practices and to really build confidence in the vaccine. So um, with that, you know, we couldn't do this without the support of our partners, um, both our government partners and our corporate partners. We are grateful to see how many people are stepping up in support of this response. Um, and it just, you know, makes me feel that through these incredible collaborations that hope and, and most especially better health is on the way to India and AmeriCares is, is absolutely here to be a strong partner in that effort. Thank you, Tara, very much. And Thanks. Just so people are clear, you know, we're, we picked AmeriCares to be a list of, of many nonprofits. We can't have everyone speak. Um, but again, if you have uh, trusted nonprofit partners who are delivering services in India, I'll say what the U.S. government can't say. Give them money, right? They need help, right? Please help them uh, as they are saving lives. So, uh, Dr. Mokda, we're going to go quickly to you for a few minutes just to give us projections uh, from the University of Washington. This is your specialty, uh, and then we're going to move into Q and A for our speakers and beyond when, beyondward. So, Dr. Mokda, to you. Perfect. Can you see my screen? Thank you for inviting me to participate. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So briefly, I want to talk about the projections uh, that we have for India. Uh, IHME has been working in India for a long time. We have two faculty from IHME station at Population Health India, and we have wor been working on the global burden of disease at the subnational level in India for a long time. Uh, we are concerned at IHME right now, as everybody, about the variants that are circulating globally in India. We know for sure that B117 is circulating, the one that uh, was first discovered in the UK, and B1351, the one that first was discovered in South Africa. And uh, we are not aware of any sequencing right now reported in India for P1, the one that was discovered in Brazil. But we know there is little sequencing in India for us to know what's happening, especially as a trend, what's changing, and how these uh, variants are interacting together, which one is becoming the dominant. From what we know, uh, B117 is the one that usually in a location takes over and becomes the dominant in a way, which is good for us. There is nothing good about any variant with COVID-19, but B117 is not an escape variant. We have cross immunity and the vaccines do much better against it. And of course, uh, right now we have more variants in India, B1617 and reported about another variant that's triple mutation. 
uh, the effective R uh, in India, according to our data on April 8, is above one everywhere in India, indicating that cases will keep increasing until this week. So, and I'll show you that data. India is not doing a good job in detecting the infections simply because the sheer number of uh, infected people in India. So we believe about 3% of cases are being detected. So that's very important. When you hear 300,000 cases a day, that's a dire situation in India because it means much more cases are out there in India simply for testing. Mobility, unfortunately, in India increased, and now it's coming down as a response to the surge of the pandemic. We monitor that and everywhere for our projections. I'm briefly giving you what determines our projection. And mobility varies in India. There is a huge variation when it comes to mobility in India, and that in itself will also dictate what kind of pandemic we'll have and the situation of the pandemic in different locations in India. Mask wearing is not as high as we would like to see in India, especially right now during a surge of cases. It's increasing a little bit as a response of the surge in cases, but still, again, there is a huge variation in mask wearing in India between states and India, of course, and different locations in India. Uh, globally, we are projecting about 5 million deaths by August 1st from COVID-19. Uh, and in India, before I show you the projections of India, Vaccine hesitancy is not as high as in the United States, but still, there are a lot of rumors out there about the vaccines. And then in many places, vaccine hesitancy is less than 60, I mean, vaccine acceptance is less than 60%. When it comes to cases in India, we're expecting as of today about 13 million, 13 and a half million cases. Yesterday, it was about 14 million. Based on what we are seeing in India and the course of the pandemic, we believe cases will start coming down and, and slowly coming down in the coming days in India. It doesn't mean that the pressure on India health system will ease in two, three weeks. No, there'll be a lot of cases coming to hospitals, unfortunately. As far as for deaths in India, we are seeing right now about 13,000 deaths a day. This is a scalar of what's reported because we know many of the cases, and that's true for every country in the world, are not reported, and many of the deaths are not reported for COVID-19. IHME were released today, total deaths from COVID for every country in the world, including what's India, and that's the visualization for it. We expect in India by August 1st, unfortunately, and we hope we are wrong, totally wrong, about 960,000 deaths, a little bit less than a million simply because of this pandemic has been spreading so fast. My main concern today for all of you is the vaccine efficacy. AstraZeneca has been used in India right now, and we know AstraZeneca publications in New England Journal of Medicine from the clinical trials that were done in South Africa. It's efficacy against the P1 and B1351, and therefore the B1617 that's now circulating in India is 10%. We don't believe AstraZeneca, unfortunately, is going to help India that much simply because of the variants that's circulating in India, unfortunately. And I just want to make that clear. Uh, again, the recommendation remained the same in India for uh, preventing COVID-19. But I want to sum briefly. I shared some dire numbers that are very sad. I pray for the people of India. This is the holy month of Ramadan for me as a Muslim. I pray for the people of India and for everybody in India. India is in a dire situation, but the whole world is in a dire situation. What's happening in India will impact and will determine COVID-19 globally because of the violence that will emerge in India is going to impact all of us. And then we are so concerned about these new variants simply because millions and millions of cases are occurring every day, allowing the virus to mutate. We'll see a heavy death toll in India, a lot of burden of disease in India. It has a global impact on vaccine production because India is a main producer of vaccines. As we all know, they're very good about producing vaccine. And I want to end up, we're not safe. None of us, none of us is safe until everybody out there is safe. And I will add, this is the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. As an American, I don't feel safe. And for my national interest is to protect people in India. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Mokdad. We appreciate your, your comments. Uh, Nisha, over to you before we start with Q&A. Um, thank you so much. Well, I, I just wanted to make a couple of quick points. First of all, I um, want to just say that there's still a lot of uh, research that's being done on the different variants and the drug efficacy. And so I don't think that uh, 
Dr. Mokhtad in any way was saying um, or discouraging the use of AstraZeneca, which is incredibly important in terms of the uh, vaccine adoption. And, and we want to continue to support uh, um, that use and uh, want to make sure we clarify that. Um, and second of all, I think the other point that has been made um, um, that you know, we're looking at this not really just from what's happening in India, it's very urgent what's happening in India and all eyes and attention is focused there, but it has implications for the region and it has implications globally as well. And for that reason, um, I wanted to make sure we brought into the conversation uh, my colleague in the international division, uh, Charles Freeman, um, to talk a little bit about the uh, focus on the region and the fact that the uh, effort that the business community is mobilizing and that the chamber is mobilizing um, is focused on India, but is also looking at the global needs and the regional needs as well. So can I um, turn it to Charles? Um, thank you very much, Nisha, and, and thanks to, to this group and thanks to the audience. Uh, you know, without wanting to take any of the urgency away from from the situation in India, you know there is is concern, and I think rightly so, that uh, uh, that what's happening in India India will be re repeated in in other parts of South and Southeast Asia. And uh, uh, just wanted to to uh, ask this group or, or ask um, uh, some of this group to talk about the 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 fact that we're standing up this effort now. And you know how this uh, how this has uh, has the potential to to uh, to bear on on future crises in in South and Southeast Asia, if not not elsewhere. Thanks. Look, uh, Charles, thank you. I'll, I'll try to take a, a, a shot at that. I think one of the reasons why we initiated the vaccine initiative as part of the Quad uh, earlier this year and. For those of you who were not following, the idea with American financing from the DFC, from Japan, from JBIC, and from JIC, uh, we worked closely with Indian uh, manufacturers, uh, also with J&J, &J, to create over time the capacity in India that would be able to supply during 2022 up to a billion doses. Now, the initial idea was this would be directed towards challenges in Southeast Asia uh, and across the Pacific. I think you rightly point out, uh, Charles, that we are likely to face similar challenges in countries surrounding India. I think the model that, of what we are putting together here has to be replicated, perhaps in smaller scale elsewhere. And we need to recognize that this is not simply a country challenge, but a regional challenge. And, the, and at the same time, recognize that the linchpin in our effort to address a broader set of challenges in Southeast Asia, the Pacific, and South Asia is actually India. That India's role as really the global uh, superpower with respect to vaccine production is essential for us. And that we not only have to deal with the profound human suffering of the kind that human that Gail and others have described, but also ensure that we're working with India so that it can continue to play its critical role uh, in this endeavor going forward. Thank you, Kurt. Um, we've got some questions in the chat box that I wanted to share with the audience, uh, share with the, the presenters. Uh, the first question is, is the work that we're talking about, is it being facilitated just through the national government in India or uh, is there a potential to work directly with the individual, individual states? Yes, I can take some of that. Jeremy, do you want to take a first cut? I'd be happy to. Um, I would say uh, that is still something that's under development. We would really welcome your input on what would be most helpful. I, I think we are, you know, through the USAID mission and the partnerships that we have on the ground, we engage at, at both of those levels um, and at a, at a fairly local level as well. Um, so would, would welcome your thoughts and guidance on what would be most useful to you as, as, uh, as the business community. But I think we're, we're prepared to help um, facilitate where we can uh, and where it makes the most sense. And, and along those lines, Jeremy, another question is uh, around customs and how can the US government uh, help facilitate uh, transportation of goods into customs? Um, I'm going to take, the, if I can take that one back, um, I know that there are, there have been some um, 
some announcements by the Indian government of expediting uh, customs clearance for certain kinds of items. I don't have that at my fingertips now, but we can, I think that that's a useful flag to us to be tracking that kind of information. We can also work with Nisha's team uh, at the chamber to make sure that you have that kind of information available to you and that there's a query process on that. I think I can answer just a little bit more, Jeremy. I think it would be fair to say that we have ongoing discussions with the government in India about coordination, both at the federal and the state level. The expectation is that we will do both, but I think the government in India right, uh, rightly and rightfully wants full transparency about what's going on inside the country more generally. And they have agreed to establish a process to assist in issues associated with customs and other bureaucratic uh, issues at airports. I, I think you understand these are complex matters. We're working carefully, rapidly, and in close consultation with Indian partners. And I wanted to just jump in on that po point as well um, to, to just note that for the business community as well, we are coordinating uh, very much with uh, the government of India and working um, under their leadership and direction in terms of the logistics coordination um, for the private sector uh, with uh, um, getting, uh, getting assistance to the right place in India. And it, Nisha, may I add something very quickly to this? And I think this is one of the reasons why it's so important that we work together on this and where I think we can affect certain divisions of labor. It, the, the response operation to this crisis qualifies as a complex response. We all know the magnitude of the crisis that is unfolding, the effect not only on people, but on the healthcare system. And then there are all the knock-on effects because of various lockdowns and so on. And in those cases, things like customs procedures, logistics, which region is which is reached when are very fluid. And some of that depends on which direction the surge moves. Some of that depends on where the supply chains are the most effective. Some of that depends on the sheer urgency of the matter or on efforts to try to calibrate assistance so multiple areas are covered. I think it's fair to say that we anticipate that at the height of this kind of complex emergency, uh, it's going to be very fluid for a while as, as things fall into place. We are collectively going to have to be very agile and very nimble. One of the things I think we can do is certainly on things like customs. Uh, in my experience, these things evolve oftentimes because suddenly there is such a high quantity of material to move that governments make different decisions. And we will have to see where the government of India goes on that. We'll work closely with them and with you to sort it out. But I think we should all be aware that there are gonna be some things we can do in this first phase, but this is an operation that is going to morph and change shape depending on the nature of the surge, the scale of the act, actual operational architecture that is put in place to respond. And then when that rhythm sets in. My last point on this is the, the calls I referred to where we can connect regularly is one of the places where we can work through some of that and fine tune what we're all doing so that we can work through the openings that exist, achieve maximum scale, and then quite frankly, grow as the operation grows. Because this is, this is quite complex. I think it's, it's doable with the will, uh, all of us in partnership uh, with the Indian government and others in India, but that's kind of the way we expect it to work. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Uh, Kurt, this may be uh, best handled by you, but I think Nisha may have some input as well. Um, can you talk about collaborations on technology and uh, whether it's around IP or manufacturing and uh, what the discussions have, have looked like thus far? I'm, I'm sure, Mark, I, with related, with, with related to, uh, to vaccines in particular, that's right. Yeah, I, you know, I Mark, if, if it's all right, I, I, I think we're we're encouraged on specific issues associated with vaccines. We have a vaccine team here. I think on one of your next calls, I would recommend Beth Cameron, who works closely with Gail and I. She's um, helping run the COVID task force on uh, vaccine related issues. We've had a recent meeting two or three days ago. We, we are moving out on some specific areas of collaboration. As you've heard, we've made available some specific uh, component uh, for AZ as we go forward. I, I, I think I'd rather let the experts answer that uh, in greater detail. 
And I, I have to apologize, Mark. I've got about one or two more minutes. I, I know there's so many other questions, but I, I know, Nish, and you are going to have these uh, dialogues and discussions going forward. We will actively participate in them. Um, thank you. And I, and I do think we have active mechanisms for working with the government of India on all of these kinds of concerns, whether it's respect to IP. Uh, what we have found is that the government has been extremely forward-leaning and responsive in trying to remove the constraints to allow um, all of the uh, um, um, assistance that's flowing in, all of the support that's flowing in, whether it's on customs uh, issues, whether it's on um, looking at any regulatory relaxations, so uh, we can help uh, um, um, address those uh, as, as companies are, are, um, have questions about them. I think that's right, Nisha, and that's great. I think that's an area we can really work together, but I think there's a there's an open door for the kind of assistance I think that we are all aiming to provide. Thank you, Gail. And Kurt, we know you have to leave. Uh, thanks for your time. We appreciate uh, you spending so much time with us uh, from the White House. I think we've got time for one more question, uh, Dr. Mokdad. Um, the estimates that you showed us, uh, do they factor in uh, the potential for underreporting? Yes, yes, they do. So the cases that we are saying are include underreporting. When I say about 13.5 million, that uh, accounting for underreporting. And when I say a little bit less than a million deaths by August 1st, that's accounting for underreporting. Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, Nisha, uh, we're a little bit over time. Uh, do you want to close this out? And uh, we will make sure that everyone uh, who has participated in this call uh, will get uh, a link to the audio recording. Uh, on our website, so you can you can see this again or view this again, uh, as well as uh, being put on a list uh, for future future convenings. So, Nisha, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Mark, and I want to thank um, all of our uh, friends who participated with us today. Um, I know that uh, Kurt, Gail, Jeremy, um, your days are incredibly filled, and so thank you for making time for us today, um, and uh, and for our uh, friends and partners at AmeriCares and, and um, with the University of Washington for your presentations. Look, I think we have not only an unprecedented challenge, but an unprecedented and extraordinary mobilization and commitment, a commitment from the government of the United States and governments around the world, a commitment from the American private sector that I have never seen in my 30 plus years of working in public service um, and a commitment from the government and people of India to work in partnership with all of us to address this because as has been repeated so many times, India has not only uh, been trying to manage the pandemic in its own borders, but India to the management of the global pandemic and the efforts that we are undertaking here today are not only aimed at supporting the people of India, but it's about how we're going to support the next phase of the global pandemic. And so the countries in the region, Bangladesh, you know, Pakistan, Nepal, uh, as we look into Southeast Asia, it's going to be incredibly important that we think about this as a sustained effort. We here at the chamber at USIBC, working with our partners at the Business Roundtable, at the USISF, and many others are committed to doing this in a way that is sustained um, and that is really looking at the comprehensive uh, needs that are, that are out there. And we need the support of all of you who are out there watching this. And so let us work together to tackle this challenge. Thank you. Nisha for all of that. Let me just say on behalf of all of us, thank you. We are uh, pleased to spend this time with you and even more pleased to roll up our sleeves and work together uh, to do everything that we can. So thank you very much for this time. And we look forward to increased and frequent collaboration. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for joining us.